Hey everybody, welcome to period four, the age of reform, part two. This is lesson 4.11.2. And we have the same objective as part one, which is to explain both how and why various reform movements developed and expanded in the United States from 1800 to 1848. So we're going to start first with the abolitionist and anti-slavery movements, which grew primarily in the northern region of the country. And abolition and anti-slavery grew for a number of reasons. One was religious objections. Um, the Second Great Awakening had started a religious revival in the United States, and the Sisterhood of Reform talked about bettering society. And for a small number of people, having enslaved people in the nation was a violation of their religious principles. Another reason was economics. The northern states did not use enslaved people for labor. It was found very sporadically throughout those states, and most had already abolished it. However, northern states failed to take into account that the cotton produced by enslaved people in the southern states is what fed the northern textile mills. So while slavery was not directly found in the northern states, it certainly did benefit them. <clears throat> And finally, it allowed the Northerners to take what I call a higher moral ground, or moral high ground, I should read my notes, um, where they could say slavery is bad and we object to it for all these moral reasons and we want to end it. But really, they're using the moral high ground as a cover for political reasons. Um, because as the slave population increases in the South, so does its representation in the House of Representatives in Congress, so does its presence in the Senate as new slave states are added to the Union, and the northern states wanted to maintain their political leverage over the South so they could do that without openly claiming it by taking a moral ground that really wasn't necessarily a moral ground. Now, in the North, there are both anti-slavery and abolitionist movements, Sisterhood of Reforms again. Remember that they, they're not one thing. Um, and these movements in the North were not in harmony with each other. There was conflict between them. So let's start with the anti-slavery movement, which was a movement, as it says, against slavery. And the anti-slavery movement relied on emancipation, which is the freeing of enslaved people. And the anti-slavery movement felt primarily only owners could free enslaved people. Sometimes planters would do that in their wills or if they needed money and they could no longer maintain a slave-based plantation. Um, but that problem with emancipation was that the anti-slavery forces felt that government, state or national, could not mandate emancipation. They couldn't require it, and therefore they could not end slavery. And their thinking is this. Under the law in all states, enslaved people were property. So if the government ordered people to free their slaves, they would be emancipating their property. It would be like legally the equivalent today of the government seizing their car and not paying them for it. So anti-slavery forces said we can't force the government to take action because constitutionally and legally they cannot. The other thing that they were concerned about was citizenship for people who were emancipated slaves. Um, even while the northern states were abolishing slavery, they were also passing laws that clarified that free black people were not citizens, which meant their legal right to own property was dubious. They did not have the right to vote. They could not serve on juries. And so a lot of the anti-slavery forces, while they were against slavery, weren't necessarily for black citizenship. Um, if you remember the American Colonization Society, um, which was one of the, the anti-slavery movements, even said we're going to take um, freed black people and take them back to Africa because they didn't want them intermingling and competing with white workers or marrying white women. Um, so they chose to remove and use colonization. Now, a much smaller movement in the North than the anti-slavery movement was the abolitionist movement. And the abolitionist movement was about abolishing slavery. And they did believe the government had the power to abolish slavery. It didn't have to rely on owners to emancipate. The loudest voice in the abolitionist movement 
was William Lloyd Garrison, who was a white abolitionist out of Boston. He had a newspaper he published called The Liberator, which was a, an abolitionist newspaper. He spoke around the country on abolitionist viewpoints, and Garrison was fiery as all get out. He burned copies of the Constitution because he said it endorsed slavery with the Three-Fifths Compromise. And he called for the expulsion of the Southern states from the Union because they had slavery. In Boston, which is a Northern city, um, Garrison was almost hanged or lynched by a crowd um, until the police intervened because they felt so strongly about what he was saying. Garrison's a part of the smallest group. In, in the North, which is radical abolitionists. And radical abolitionists believe not only should slavery be ended, not only should the government be the entity that ends slavery with no compensation, because it's wrong, it's morally wrong, but third, they believe that black people should be given equal rights as citizens once slavery is abolished. So that viewpoint was the smallest minority of Northerners who were opposed to slavery. Now, if we take a look at another marginalized group at this time, and that is women. Um, and if you remember, there was a cult of domesticity that pervaded American culture. It divided the, the society into two spheres, the private sphere of the home where the women were and the public sphere, which was doing business and politics out in the outside world where men were. And those two worlds weren't supposed to cross. The sisterhood of reforms very much appealed to middle class women. Most of them had working class women that came into their home and did their cooking and their cleaning and their housework. Their children had been moved into public schools, so they no longer had to educate them at home. So middle class women had a lot of time on their hands. Their families had disposable income. And the sisterhood allowed women to move into the public sphere if they were doing moral or Christian work. So uh, the temperance movement very much appealed to women, middle class women, because they saw the evils of alcohol um, on the family and how it led to husbands coming home and becoming abusive or potentially even losing the family's money or losing their job. So temperance was a natural draw to women. Um, the abolition movement was as well. A lot of women saw themselves in similar legal straits as enslaved people. They had no rights in the United States legally. So they, they felt that the abolition of slavery might also lead to the abolition of women, so to speak. Now, within the Sisterhood of Reforms, even in movements where women were predominant and active, sexism still existed, where women were discriminated against. Most leadership positions were held by men. Um, women were... A, allowed in as workers and sometimes speakers, but they didn't make decisions. They were kept in that secondary role. Um, in some cases, women were even met with violence when they were speaking in public about issues of temperance and abolition. So even though women were outside of the home in the public sphere, a lot of times they were pushed to a second class position. A great example was the World Anti-Slavery Conference, which was held in London, England. Um, a bunch of women abolitionists traveled there to hear William Lloyd Garrison speak. And Garrison was both in favor of women's rights and abolition of slavery. He was kind of um, a message that resonated with women. But they found when they got there, they were only allowed to attend Garrison's speech if they sat behind the curtain so that their presence wouldn't disrupt the proceedings proceedings of the conference are take away from Garrison's message because they were women in a public sphere. So some of those women who went to the World Anti-Slavery Conference included Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, two women who came back to the United States and were at the forefront of what we call first wave feminism. This is the movement for women to secure and demand more rights. And for first wave feminism, um, leaders like Mott and Stanton decided they needed the vote, that suffrage, the right to vote, was the most important thing to secure with with women. And if they could get the right to vote, then they could vote on policymakers who would change the laws about divorce or the laws about child custody or even the laws about slavery. But they said everything hinged on women getting the right to vote. And that became the focus of first wave feminism. 
Uh, Mott and Stanton put together a conference for women's rights at the Seneca Falls Convention in New York in 1848. Women and men who were sympathetic to the cause of first wave feminism met and debated how they should proceed. And uh, Stanton drew up a declaration of sentiments. Like so many other documents we've seen, it was based on the Declaration of Independence because of the symbolic value. And the Declaration of Sentiments outlined women's declaration of independence from men, and it even outlined a list of grievances of things that men had done to keep women in secondary positions. But the most important part of the Declaration of Sentiments was women's demand for the right to vote. <clears throat> And even as the, the first wave feminist movement began to take off, it almost paused within the next 20 years because a lot of women within the movement felt that abolition was a more pressing cause because women, while they had limited rights, were not enslaved and shackled and beaten and killed to the degree that African Americans were. So a lot of first wave feminists focused their attention on the abolition movement and worked to get slavery to end with the expectation that when slavery finally ended and free black people got citizenship and legal rights, those would be extended to women and there would be a solidarity between these two marginalized groups. So we don't see first wave feminism really pick up again until after the Civil War. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Oh, nope, we're not done. We got one more slide. I forgot to remind you that we want to talk about how and why various reform movements developed and expanded from 1800 to 1848 with this particular lesson of focus on abolition and feminism. Now I can say thank you all so much and have a great day.